God arranged for the Apostle Peter and the Roman centurion Cornelius to meet because he wanted the gospel to find a foothold among the Gentiles. And you may remember from last week's sermon from the book of Acts, after the two men met, Peter asked Cornelius, tell me, why did you send for me? And Cornelius told Peter about the heavenly vision that he had received. And then he said, I sent for you at once and it was good of you to come. Now, here we are waiting before God to hear the message the Lord has given you. No preacher can ask for a better audience than that. <laughs> here we are. We want to hear a message from God. And I really hope that you're here ready to listen to a message from God's Word because that's what I want to try to do. Now, I realize before I read the text that I've said this a number of times before. Today's text is rather long. But we need to hear the whole story. And, and it, it dawned on me that, that some people might think, well, don't, don't read the whole passage. Just tell us about it. Just preach about it. And I can't do that. The scripture reading is the best part of my sermons, folks. My exposition may be faulty. My illustrations may be weak. But the Word of God is never faulty, and the Word of God is never weak. So I, I want to read this whole text. But this is a great story, and everybody loves a good story. We all love to hear a good story, so I just beg you to listen carefully to what Peter said now to Cornelius. They've met. The Holy Spirit has brought them together. They've met, and now listen to what Peter says to Cornelius and his family, and then the results of that message beginning in Acts chapter 10, verse 34, reading all the way through 11, 18. I mean, it's a long reading. It may take three minutes. Maybe four. I don't know. Somebody can time it and tell me what, we, what it took. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God doesn't show partiality. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. I'm sure you've heard about the good news for the people of Israel that there is peace with God through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened in Galilee after John the Baptist began preaching. And no doubt you know that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Then Jesus went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we apostles are witnesses of all he did throughout Israel and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by crucifying him. But God raised him to life three days later. Then God allowed him to appear, not to the general public, but to us, but to us whom God had chosen beforehand to be his witnesses. We were those who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach everywhere and to testify that Jesus is ordained of God to be the judge of all, the living and the dead. He's the one all the prophets testified about, saying that everyone who believes in him will have their sins forgiven through his name. Okay, thank you, Tony. Even as Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the message. The Jewish believers who came with Peter were amazed that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles too, that there, and there could be no doubt about it, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter asked, can anyone object to their being baptized now that they've received the Holy Spirit, just as we did? So he gave orders for them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Afterward, Cornelius asked him to stay with them for several days. Soon the news reached the apostles and other believers in Judea that the Gentiles had received the word of God. But when Peter arrived back in Jerusalem, some of the Jewish believers criticized him. You entered the home of Gentiles. You even ate with them, they said. And then Peter told them exactly what had happened. One day in Joppa, he said, while I was praying, I went into a trance and I saw a vision. Something like a large sheet was let down by its four corners from the sky. It came right down to me. When I looked inside the sheet, I saw all sorts of small animals, wild animals, reptiles, and birds that were not allowed to eat. And I heard a voice say, get up, Peter, kill and eat them. Never, Lord, I replied. 
I have never eaten anything forbidden by our Jewish laws. But the voice from heaven came again. If God says something is acceptable, don't say it isn't. This happened three times before the sheet and all it contained was pulled back up into heaven. And just then, three men who had been sent from Caesarea arrived at the house where I was staying. The Holy Spirit told me to go with them and not to worry about their being Gentiles. And these six brothers accompanied me, and we soon arrived at the home of the man who sent for me, or us. He told us how an angel had appeared to him in his home, and he told him, send messengers to Joppa to find Simon Peter. He will tell you how you and all your household will be saved. Well, I began telling them the good news, but just as I was getting started, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as he fell on us at the beginning. Then I thought of the Lord's words when he said, John baptized with water, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And since God gave these Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus, who was I to argue? And when the others heard this, all their objections were answered and they began praising God. They said, God has also given the Gentiles the privilege of turning from sin and receiving eternal life. If you were here last week, you might recall that I divided the whole Cornelius narrative into seven scenes, and here are the first four that I mentioned in last week's sermon. Just want to remind you of them. Cornelius' vision was the first scene, and then Peter's vision is the second scene, and then Peter meets the messengers from Caesarea, the third scene, and then scene four, Peter and Cornelius meet. This morning, we're going to look at the remaining three scenes. So, uh, Keaton, let's go to that one. Number five is this, Peter's sermon, his message. Chapter 10, verses 34 through 43. And I, I found this message, this abbreviated sermon, uh, to be really interesting. And I think it's an important model for us as we present the gospel to truth seekers like Cornelius. And of particular interest to me was Peter's emphasis on the life and the ministry of Jesus. And I think that's significant because when we teach people, they need to see that Jesus was a real person. And so Peter says, you know, you've heard about what happened in Judea, Galilee. He has places where this really happened. Uh, how Jesus went around doing things. He, he did good and, and he healed people. He even gives a specific time frame after John the Baptist began preaching. All of that is important because you will meet people, even in the church, who say, you know, it, it really doesn't matter if Jesus was a real person or not. What we need to do is just kind of follow the Spirit uh, of his teaching and, 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 you know, just listen to that. But it really, if he was a real person or not, that doesn't matter. Oh, I disagree with that so much. It's vital to me that Jesus was real, that he was a historical person. If he was not, then the cross and the resurrection that Peter mentions, how he was crucified and how God raised him three days later, then that's totally meaningless because they didn't happen. If he's not a real person, then the cross is not real and the resurrection is not real. And we find ourselves to be liars if we tell people that he died so that they might find peace with God and forgiveness of their sins. So I think the way he begins here with talking about how Jesus was a real person, where he lived, when he lived, what he did before he died and was resurrected, that's very important. He was a real, genuine person. But there are some other features of this sermon that I think are significant. One thing I noticed, Jesus is approved by God. Did you get that? Verse 38, God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Also in verse 38, God was with him. Verse 40, God raised him to life. Also in verse 40, God allowed him to appear. In verse 42, Jesus is ordained by God to be the judge of all. And then in verse 43, all the prophets testify about him. He doesn't use the name God, but all the prophets refer to the Old Testament, to the word of God. He is ordained, approved of by God. Folks, it's not enough for somebody to say, oh yeah, I think maybe Jesus really lived and I think he's a good man and had some good teaching. No, in order to find peace with God, 
Jesus must be accepted. He must be trusted as the one who is described here by Peter, one approved by God, one empowered by God, one raised from the dead by God. And he also declares that Jesus is Lord of all, verse 36. That just immediately captured my attention. See, he's not just Lord of the Jews. He's not just Lord of Americans. He's Lord of all, all humans, all nations, all of history, all of the future, all of creation finds its meaning and its purpose and its destiny in Jesus. He is Lord of all. Now, when I look at that whole message, the implication is that everybody needs to know about Jesus. I mean, Cornelius is a good, God-fearing man, but he needed to know about Jesus. I like something that R.C.H. Linsky, a noted Lutheran commentator of a hundred or so years ago. But Lenski made this comment. He said, if his, talking about Cornelius, now listen to this. If his honest pagan convictions had been sufficient, why seek the synagogue? And if the synagogue had been enough, why was Peter there? Obviously to tell him about Jesus. And I think, I believe that sometimes we just overthink the question of who is to, who can be saved or who is saved. And this question comes up. I've asked this question. Can an honest pagan who's never heard the gospel of Jesus be saved? Let me tell you what. I'll leave that to God. But what I need to do is what Peter did is to tell people the good news about Jesus. And as I said, I think we just over talk and overthink and, and, and we argue about these things when what we need to be doing is telling folks the good news and let God take care of all of those other things. We need to be sharing the good news because as that song says, people need the Lord. People need the Lord. And that's our job is to tell them about Jesus. Okay, Keaton, let's go to the next one. Scene six is the Gentiles receive the Spirit. This is chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. Peter's message is interrupted. In the very process of speaking, the Holy Spirit fell on Cornelius and all of those in his house who had heard the message. They began to speak in tongues. They began to praise God. It's Pentecost in Caesarea all over again, only this time with the Gentiles. Now, nowhere else in the book of Acts does the Spirit come before baptism. And that creates a problem for some people, especially those who would like to establish a, a real definite pattern that fits every conversion story. Now, most certainly, and the reason I think it happened, is that these are the first Gentile converts. That's an important factor in this whole story. And the Spirit came upon them as evidence to the Jewish believers that God accepted the Gentiles as well. I mean, you can't deny the coming of the Holy Spirit, the speaking in tongues, and the praising God. I think that's, that's a good explanation. But I see a couple of other important lessons in this particular part of the story. First of all, you can't put God in a box, okay? You can't put God in a box. He doesn't do everything in exactly the same way. In Acts, every conversion story is somewhat different. Now, there are common factors in all of them, but they're all somewhat different. That tells me that God, God meets people where they are in order to bring them to Christ. That, that's what he does. And so don't try to put him in a box. And the second thing is this. We are not the ones who administer the Spirit. God gives the Spirit. And he gives it to whomever he wills. Remember what Jesus told Nicodemus? He said, just as you can hear the wind, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going, so you can't explain how people are born of the Spirit. That's God's doing. So don't put God in a box and don't think that you somehow administer the Spirit. However, no matter how you deal with the question of the Spirit coming before baptism, the fact remains that Cornelius and his family were all baptized that very day. Luke's talking about water baptism here. You don't hear anybody said, I've, I've got the Spirit. Nobody says, I've got the Spirit. I don't need to be baptized. You don't hear that. Peter gave orders for them to be baptized, and they were. Now, I, 
I cannot give any such orders. Thank goodness I can't do that. But I can urge you in the strongest possible way to be baptized in water if you have never done that in the name of Jesus. Now you may consider yourself to be a Christian. You may feel that you have the Holy Spirit. That's well and good. But if you have not obeyed the New Testament command to be baptized, something is missing in your walk with Christ. In just a few minutes, we're going to give you an opportunity to be baptized. Let me tell you, there's warm water in the baptistry. We have clothes you can change into in order to be baptized. The whole congregation would rejoice with you and your obedience. So I want you to consider the matter of your baptism. If it's never happened in your life, I want you to consider that while I conclude the sermon. And then we're going to come back to it, all right? Okay, let's go to the seventh scene. The Jewish believers approve. It wasn't long before the Jerusalem church heard the news about the Gentiles. And there were some, literally those of the circumcision, they're called. Our text just said some of the Jewish believers, but the real... The real uh, literal translation is those of the circumcision. But they criticized Peter. You, you went into the home of Gentiles. You even ate with them. And then they could have said, and we hear that you stayed with them. Cornelius invited you and you stayed there. Well, again, we come face to face with that great gulf between Jew and Gentile in that first century world. The Jewish community had come up with all kinds of rules and regulations that would keep them completely separate from the Gentiles. Now, I want to give you some examples. I, I'm reading a book now, an old classic called The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah by Alfred Edersheim. Uh, Edersheim was a Jewish person who was converted to Christ. And back in about 1880, he wrote this it's a huge book, but uh, it's a classic and in that book, at the beginning, he talks about the world into which Jesus was born and talks about the Jewish situation. And he gave some examples like this. If a tree had been used in idol worship in some way, maybe there had been an altar built on it or something like that, a Jew couldn't even set in its shade. And the very wood of that tree was polluted. And if that wood was used for baking, the bread was unclean. Jews could not rent houses or land. They could not sell cattle to Gentiles. Milk drawn by a Gentile was unclean. Oil and bread prepared by them was unlawful. That's the kind of prejudice that Peter encounters in Jerusalem. And so there's that, that gulf. It still exists. There are Christians here uh, saying, Peter, you, you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have gone to them and gone into their house and, and, and you shouldn't have eaten with them and stayed with them. But Peter patiently and gently told him the whole story about his vision and Cornelius' vision and how the Spirit was given to the Gentiles just as it had been given to them earlier. And just as Peter had been convinced by the evidence, so was the Jerusalem church, I'm thankful to say. And they had no further objections, at least for the time being. It's going to come up again, believe me. But at least for the time being, they had no further objections, and they praised God for his boundless mercy. F.F. F. Bruce made this comment. Their criticism ceased, their worship began, and it made me think, as long as we are critical of each other, we probably don't worship. And if you're here today saying, I didn't get anything out of worship, is it because you have a critical spirit? If we're just critical all the time of each other for whoever, you know, whatever it might be, we probably don't worship God. And the way to become less critical is to hear each other out. As we saw in our text, they listened as Peter said, look, here's what happened. Who was I to object to what God was doing? The better we know where the other person's coming from, then the less critical we become. And I don't want any of us to, I, I troubled with that myself, just having a critical spirit as I'm troubled with prejudice in my life as well. But we need, we need to let God empty us of those things. Okay, my thoughts on this text are over. And as I promised, 
I want to give you an opportunity to obey Christ's command to be baptized in the name of Jesus. We're going to sing a beautiful song, Spirit of the Living God, Fall Fresh on Me. And as we sing, you might want to walk down the aisle and express your desire to be baptized. Or you can talk to me or anyone else after services. But everything's ready for that to happen. And here's what I want you to think about. We've been studying the book of Acts now for, I think this is about the 15th sermon in this series. Here's what we've heard about baptism. On the day of Pentecost in chapter 2, 3,000 people are baptized. The Samaritans are baptized, both men and women, in chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, also in chapter 8, was baptized. Saul of Tarsus is baptized. Cornelius and his family are baptized here in chapter 10. How about you? How about you? Something you need to think about. And if there's that desire in your heart, we'd like to, we'd like to help you obey Christ in that way. Let's stand together and sing this song. And all of us can pray, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. <laughs>